Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I'm turning off my cell phone, so if you can too, that'd be great. And um, that way you can hear Bill's genius kind of uninterrupted. I'm Steve Davis. I'm the assistant curator here for the Southwestern Writers Collection. And it's my great honor to welcome you all here. And I get to introduce our special guest today. And um, my apologies in advance because I'm going to take a little more time probably than I should. But, um, you know, when you have somebody like Bill Minutaglio come to your campus, it's such a great opportunity. And I sort of want to make sure everybody has kind of an idea of who it is we have here today. And so please bear with me, and if you start to fall asleep, just rest assured that Bill will be coming up pretty soon to talk himself. So many of you probably know, if you hang around places like this, the Literary Archive, or read much about how writing is done, you know that pretty much 99% of the writers working in the world today do not make a dime from their writing. And so they're compensated in a different form of currency and that is abundant, fulsome praise. And they get this praise from those who understand best how much they need it, and that's other writers. And so if any of you uh, remember the old spy magazine, it had a very funny feature called Log Rolling in Our Time. And this was about the reciprocal dust jackets that authors would routinely give each other. For example, Anthony Burgess would describe Robertson Davies as a mature and wise writer, while Davies would pronounce Burgess a delight to read. Closer to home, we have some kind of funny examples from some of the writers we have here in the Southwestern Writers Collection. Um, here's a novel by Bud Schrake, and it's blurbed by Larry L. King, who basically says that Schrake writes with wit and a lyrical quality, even when addressing frontier violence and rough justice. He entertains even as he instructs. And about the same year, Larry Old King's book came out, and here's Bud Shrake. This book takes you inside the life of a working writer, and it's peppered with stories that'll make you laugh out loud. So, you know. And this, this trend has really kind of increased in recent years to the point where even those writers I call the caninographers are doing it. Some of you may be familiar with John Katz, who wrote Soul of a Dog. And here's what he said about Don, uh, John Grogan, the author of Marley and Me. In the hands of a writer as observant, unsentimental, and piercing as Grogan, this human canine journey, this is one that dog lovers will want to take. And John Grogan on John Katz. Unburdened by sentimentality, Katz's keen insights cut to the heart of the human pet relationship. So. There's this long tradition of log rolling. And with that in mind, I was naturally very suspicious of Bill Minutaglio before I ever read his work. And that's because everywhere I turned, I would see this exorbitant, extravagant praise for his writing. I'd read comparisons of his work to people like Tom Wolfe and Hunter Thompson, and I'd just kind of shake my head and go, yeah, right. And then something funny happened. Um, I happened to cross an excerpt of one of Bill's books and it was reprinted in an anthology, Literary Austin. And of course, I was just blown away. <laughs> and it was one of those times where you run around saying, why didn't anybody tell me about this guy? And then you realize people were telling you about this guy. And so even though I realized that, you know, log rolling is an important part of the literary ecosystem, there actually are writers out there who really deserve the high praise for their work, uh, such as Bill because people are simply responding honestly to his accomplishments. Over the last few years, I've loved becoming familiar with Bill's writing. We've been very fortunate to have him as a donor here to the Whitliffe Collections, and it's a great honor for me personally to count Bill as a friend. And Bill's one of those people, when he's your friend, he makes you feel so special and um, gives you, you know, the, the fullness of his attention and so forth. And I know there are many, many others he's like that with, and I think that gift is part of what makes Bill such a great reporter because he kind of sets people at ease and draws them out. And so I don't want to embarrass Bill by gushing too much today. <laughs> and, you know, I want to avoid the, the log rolling thing myself. But, but I want to provide a little background for how, how this book came to be published in our book series. 
It was about 1978 when Bill came to Abilene, Texas, fresh from New York City, and he spent a couple of years as a reporter in Abilene and then moved on to newspapers in San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. In each city, he confronted an ugly reality. Black Texans rarely made the news in their hometowns unless they had been accused of some sort of crime. So if you consider the ramifications of such a thing, let's say you're a historian and you want to write a history of Texas in the 20th century or some aspect of it. Well, historians naturally turn to newspapers as kind of a primary source, and a lot of people still believe that these newspapers are models of objectivity. And so as you go through these newspapers in these cities, you get, um, well, you get kind of a, it's, uh, well, I would say that, you know, the, the three blind men who were describing an elephant were probably closer on target than the newspapers in Texas have been describing African Americans in this state. And so Bill was somebody who instinctively recognized that entire communities' histories were being lost. And as somebody drawn to the African American heritage, he wanted to help preserve it. So as a young reporter, he began going to barbecue joints, record stores, churches, blues clubs, and he began walking through neighborhoods and hanging out on porches and knocking on doors. And he wasn't always welcomed, at least not at first, but his quiet, respectful persistence paid off. And before long, Minu Taglio was getting these stories. And he was writing about everything from the people on a street named Congo Street in Dallas, within the shadow of the state fairgrounds, to the underappreciated blues pianist Alex Moore, who died at age 89, while carrying his groceries home on a city bus. And as Bill noted in his story, people that age should never have to wait at bus stops. People that age should never stand alone at night, big brown bags of groceries tucked under their arms. And so you have a guy who's writing his stories about these people, and you can probably imagine how some of the editors in Texas newspapers in the 1970s and 80s, even up into the 90s, and perhaps even the present, um, we're reacting to Bill's agenda, as it were. Um, and I guess you ran into a few situations here and there, but the point is that Bill began winning these awards for his stories, and diversity gradually came into more and more favor. And so by the time Bill left um, his position as a newspaper journalist in the 1990s, he had published hundreds of stories on African Americans in Texas. And in the 2000s, Bill has emerged as a major literary figure in Texas. His work has appeared in many national magazines, um, including, as you mentioned earlier today, a People magazine, <laughs> and a few others as well. Um, and his books have been widely acclaimed. Uh, Esquire magazine called his first book, City on Fire, the explosion that devastated a Texas town and ignited a historic legal battle. This is the book about the Texas City explosion, 1947. If you're not familiar with that. Um, Esquire called that one of the greatest tales of survival ever told. And the Washington Post described it as a terrific nonfiction work that has the narrative force of an adventure novel. And the Texas Observer said simply that this book is one of the finest books ever written about Texas. And that book was optioned by the actor Tom Cruise. And um, we're kind of hoping that Tom will get on with making the movie now so Bill can retire in comfort. And, and then there was another Minutaglia opus, First Son, George W. Bush and the Bush Family Dynasty, and that was called Excellent by the New York Review of Books, Masterly by The Economist. And if you saw Oliver Stone talking about his movie W, he kept talking about Bill's book and how great it was. And another nonfiction book is The President's Counselor, The Rise to Power of Alberto Gonzalez, which the New York Times called Fascinating, the San Antonio Express called Brilliant, and the San Francisco Chronicle called Chilling. And I don't think we've heard yet what Alberto Gonzalez himself thinks of the book, but I imagine if you asked him, he would say that he doesn't recall having read it, right? So. And in 2009, Bill co-authored the biography of Molly Ivins with Michael Smith. And this book performed the great accomplishment of deepening our appreciation for that wonderfully complex person that Molly Ivins was while at the same time kind of describing the entire social context that helped create her and who she became. And this book, like pretty much everything Bill does, earned stellar reviews from coast to coast. And Bill teaches in journalism department at 
the University of Texas in Austin. And one of my favorite reviews of the Molly Ivins book uh, came from Kirkus, which said, aspiring journalists, read this book and then get to work. So kind of where we are here at the Southwestern Writers Collection, we have this guy who's become a major writer in Texas. And back in his personal history and his literary archives are these many, many really amazing stories he's written about African Americans in Texas. And the significance of these early stories has really ripened over the years. And these have become basically history now. And these are stories that chronicle people whose lives would have been lost forever if Bill hadn't been there to, to get the stories down on paper. The other thing I should say about Bill is he's not only a terrific reporter, he's a, one of the most gifted writers to call Texas home. His writing is informed by a deep passion for the blues, and he works in a rhythmic, circular motion. He kind of gathers groups of words together, and then suddenly, kind of startlingly, they just take flight, and you're just sort of left in awe at, at the formation that uh, unfolds before you. And um, when I read Bill, I started to realize that these kind of dazzling literary riffs really evoke the great guitar leads of players like T-Bone Walker. And I started to realize why Bill has received such praise for his work, because I've noticed now um, myself the thing, same thing a lot of other writers have done, which is you, know, you study how Bill Mendotaglio handles his prose the way guitarists would study how Steve Ray Vaughan played his guitar. I mean, there's a real similarity there. And so this book here, the newest book in our series, In Search of the Blues, which is for sale out front. Um, this collects Bill's best and most enduring writing on African Americans in Texas. And a book like this really helps shift the axis of our state's literature and kind of opens up a whole new world for many white Texans um, to, to get a view, an intimate view of people and places and times that are kind of otherwise shrouded in mist. This is a great example of why our book series exists, and it's my great honor to welcome our distinguished guest, a man you could fairly describe as, well, probably the most brilliant and humane writer in American history, or maybe the history of the world even. <laughs> is, that, is that too, too much log rolling there? Okay, <laughs> that's great. So anyway, please join me in welcoming Bill Minutaglio. Steve, uh, I, I was going to say from here, you read it just the way I wrote it, but I, I, it really is. There were a couple of things you got wrong, but little, uh, some adverbs you left out. Um, but thank you very much. Holy smokes. Um, I guess we're all through because cause Steve took so long uh, doing that, which is really uh, kind of the plan we worked out. So thanks for doing that. Um, it, it's really uh, very nice uh, to be here. It's, it's an honor to be here. It's nice uh, for you to take time out in the middle of a uh, a beautiful day to uh, to uh, come here and uh, maybe cut out a class. I think I see one or two of my students here. We'll talk about that in the hallway. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, to, to <clears throat> you know, I have to do this. I wanted to thank a few people before I get started, just talking and blabbing a little bit about this this book that I wrote. Uh, I just want to give some shout outs to the folks who uh, are the anonymous, you know, heroes when you work on a, a book. Um, there are a you know, cast of thousands behind you. Um, so uh, Teresa May at the University of Texas Press, uh, Allison Faust, um, who is the sponsoring editor at the at UT Press, uh, that uh, kind of endured a, a lot of grief from me and, and emails. Uh, Lynn Chapman, who uh, basically is sort of the Tony Robbins of copy editors. I ran across hot coals about 800 times with her, but then grew to realize it was for a good reason. Initially, maybe not so, but uh, Lynn, if you're here, thank you for straightening me out, cleaning up my copy. Uh, Dave Hamrick at UT Press as well, uh, Colleen Devine, uh, folks again who labor to, uh, you know, anonymously and quietly to, to help you look good. Um, and Joanna Hitchcock, who helps to run the, the show over there. She's going to lunch, I learned, today with my wife. And uh, I, meant to <clears throat> I meant to put a wire on, you know, one of them to, so I could figure out what they're saying about me. Um, and, and of course, I'd be really remiss when you look around uh, you, you, this building that we're in, this this wing of the building. Uh, you realize the uh, the enduring uh, treasure that that Bill Whitliff is, and uh, the the enormous contributions that he's made to uh, art 
arts and letters in Texas. Uh, this is just really a, a, a fascinating and beautiful uh, place, a great treasure. So Bill Whitliff gets a enormous respect and appreciation for the work that he's done. I know many of you uh, know him, and uh, even if you don't, you have seen uh, his handiwork, either his own work uh, or work that he's helped to, uh, to sponsor. He's truly an artist and a patron of the arts at the same time. So um, it's great to be here. It's an honor to, to have had this book you know, come out under the auspices of uh, the Southwestern Writers Collection book series. And Bill Whitliff, my extension. Um, it's kind of weird. I, I was trying to read my handwriting here. You were, the, the one log rolling thing that I really like is a, a provoc because it means nothing, but it's all, all purpose you know, when, you're, when you all are doing your next books. Just use this one. It's a provocative book about a provocative topic. That just, it just doesn't really mean anything, but it works so perfectly. It just fits. And then uh, when I used to review movies once in a blue moon uh, for the San Antonio Express News, the boiler plate there was a hats off hooray to Hollywood. It really meant nothing, but it seemed to work. And then uh, you were talking about, uh, uh, you know, maybe you were, if I heard you right, you know, writing the zeitgeist, trying to figure out what's uh, popular and selling and, you know, books about dogs and things like that. And, and coincidentally, we were, I was having a discussion with someone who had, who had once helped to run the, uh, the uh, Texas Book Festival just yesterday. Uh, and we were deciding that we need to figure out how to marry uh, the book, uh, the Twilight series with dogs. So we started off by saying uh, uh, just simply, uh, you know, twilight dogs. But then, then we settled in a, in a fit of inspiration on dogula. So it's copyrighted. Don't try to get it. We, I'm, I, we got that one. So <laughs> um, let me, uh, you know, I, I really want to linger with, with, with Steve for a second. I, I, not all of this, but uh, Steve Davis, uh, if anybody had read this story not too long ago in the Austin American Statesman, you, you, it was a wonderful story by a great writer there, Patrick Beach, who's a very astute um, writer, and, and it was a profile of Steve, um, and the, the net effect of it, the, uh, the drawdown is that Steve, um, based on many viewpoints and a lot of anecdotal evidence, is really one of the, the important figures in Texas literature today. Uh, he's written very significant books uh, about Texas literature, um, and he's helping to promote and protect Texas literature in, in these, again, almost anonymous ways that we hardly uh, hear about. And what Steve is really brilliant at doing, I urge you to please get to know him. He's right over there. You, you uh, just heard him speak. and Seek out his work because it, it accomplishes uh, things that I think a lot of uh, writers would like to get to. I know I, I sort of fumblingly tried to get to, uh, and the few students here in my class are now going to fall asleep because this is my mantra in every class that uh, really good writing, in my opinion, uh, narrative nonfiction writing, um, is uh, comprised by two key elements um, an attention to microscopic or microcosmic details, intimate details, and then just very simply uh, this macrocosmic worldview. It, what do I, these are my $10 words that I've, I've learned, you know, since I have to stand up in front of a, a class a lot. But I simply mean that you apply history and context and this panorama, the true understanding. Some people just get it, they intuit it, it just comes to them. I hate those people. Uh, other people study it and learn it and absorb it over time. Uh, just by going around, I, I think I took that ladder, ladder route because I, I Nothing comes easy uh, for me, uh, and I don't know, again, that I succeeded, but to talk about Steve and steer it back to him, Steve does that marvelously, brilliantly in his work, so that when you read it, you'll read the intimate details of someone's life, J. Frank Dovey, uh, and, and some of the other pivotal uh, writers in Texas history whom he's chronicled, uh, legacy value books, I would call that, what Steve does. So you have the, these intimate details, the anecdotes, they're, they're page turners, but as well, there's this macrocosmic um, uh, background, the landscape, figures, uh, intimate details set against this big landscape. Steve does it brilliantly. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so seek out his work. That's my way of, of uh, you know, trying to compliment you as much as you uh, complimented, complimented me. He's also a very cool guy. The last time I was in this room, um, it was for Steve's uh, reading and discussion. And so I'm, you know, thinking Steve's kind of, 
preoccupied. He's got to get his notes together and put on a good act and everything. And uh, he had a great slideshow then. I was really, uh, I was envious. Uh, but, but Steve suddenly takes a little break from what he's doing. He's mingling and, and runs to the ba back room here and comes out with a big grocery bag that, that's quite heavy and hands me a grocery bag. I see thought I hadn't been eating enough. And then um, it's filled with rocks because Steve knows that I, I love uh, to collect rocks. And Steve, being an extremely thoughtful and, and fr uh, thoughtful uh, friend of Mother Earth, collects, travels around the state uh, on a couple of missions. One is to swim in every uh, clear and clean body of water available in, in Texas with his family, but as well to collect these rocks um, that are really, as I call it, Mother Earth, Texas. Um, I, I'm lingering with Steve a little bit because this book wouldn't exist if not for Steve. Um, exercising that sort of eternal curiosity that I think goes into this exploration that he has of, uh, of all good things, elemental things, you know, literally picking up the, you know, the bedrock of Texas and, and, and looking at that rock, turning it over and looking underneath. Uh, it's, a, it's a cheap uh, uh, reference to what I think Steve might have done uh, in my case, because we didn't know each other. And through his innate curiosity, uh, having his radar turned on, his willingness to kind of take a turn down an unmarked road uh, for whatever reason, and I'm eternally grateful and blessed, to use a word, not to get uh, too religious on you, uh, but uh, that Steve decided to kind of kick over a rock and say, oh, you know, what's under there? And I came crawling out. So um, I, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're kind of, uh, going on and on about each other here, but I, I, I wanted you to know a little bit about the, the backdrop of this process and how this work came into existence. Steve, uh, uh, in some way, found me, and for the life of me, I'm, I'm somewhere north of a healthy skeptic. I'm, uh, uh, you know, uh, somewhere pretty far north uh, of that, and so I wondered what Steve's MO was, what was he up to, what's the motivation, and I, I'm still suspicious, mildly, but I, I think it's just simply born out of eternal curiosity. And, and an interest in, in taking a look at things that he thinks might approximate that marriage of intimate details, some reporting, you might call it, uh, and, and then as well this, this bigger view, this panorama. I, I don't know that I intentionally was trying to do that uh, as I was sort of working through my process and, and doing stories. I was mainly trying to stay out of the office uh, and uh, use my cheap lines like, boss, I'm going to take the pulse of the city now and that's going to probably take me all day, maybe all week, so you won't see me. Um, and then my other cheap line was when I'd come back, they'd say, well, how's the work going? I, 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 and I urge you to use this, and I tell my students, the first day of class, the only valuable thing I'm going to say to you is this line that you should use in every workplace environment. Boss, it's a building with a quiet intensity. That, that seems to work, because it has a little shine or gloss on it. and. Uh, uh, I got busted on campus uh, not too long ago. Actually, um, I, I, I was talking to uh, a colleague uh, who has m more stripes on his shoulder than I do, a higher ranking uh, professor there, <clears throat> and he was asking me, as actually several months ago, asking me, uh, uh, how's that book on Molly Ivins coming? And I, I just, I don't know, I pressed the default button over here, and I said, well, you know, it's building with a quiet intensity. And, and one of my students walked, by just as I said that, and she burst out laughing. <laughs> so I was, I was busted, but it worked. I think that was really the point. You know, the, guy, the, guy, the guy stopped bugging me. <laughs> so um, looking out across the room, by the way, there were an, an enormously talented group of people here. I'm seeing my colleague Dennis Darling uh, here, whose work uh, hangs uh, in, in this room, a uh, wonderful photographer, and, and I'm going to be remiss in not pointing out others. So uh, uh, I, I wanted to give you a shout out as well. Um, so <laughs> I have here written on my notes uh, to get back to rocks uh, that Steve knows something uh, uh, that uh, you know uh, we all should know that sometimes it's it's worth picking up that rock that that has the dirt on top and might reveal some beautiful red plume agate underneath. That's one of the treasures that Steve uh, gifted me with. And so what I wrote here is, uh, which of course is how he found me under a rock. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but I, you know, Steve uh, said to me, um, he basically said, can I take a look at some of your old stories? Uh, and it was born out of conversations, I think, and, and very long emails, uh, mostly long in my part to you. 
uh, and Steve, like a good uh, sly, uh, sort of an intellectual sleuth, I, I think, if you will, began uh, asking me about the things that I had preferred to write about when I first hit Texas. And, and it, it did uh, begin to emerge, I guess, in discussion that I, I had a preference, a predilection, and that went from a passion to an obsession. And some people, including my wife, uh, uh, who's not here so I could say this, uh, thought it bordered on an unhealthy obsession. Um, in, in covering things that I didn't understand and, and to this day still don't understand, and uh, again to it, uh, primarily African American life in, in Texas, <clears throat> excuse me, and frankly around the country, um, I, I, I should clear up something <clears throat> right away in case there's any confusion. I'm, I'm not black. I just want to be uh, clear on that. Um, the the uh, you know this book is a is a short tome. It's a collection of fifteen stories that that cross uh, over twenty five uh, to thirty years of um, of coverage at mainly mainstream newspapers uh, in in those cities that you mentioned: San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, primarily, and Abilene. Um, and, and what happened is that it, at each uh, locale back in the uh, mid to late 70s, when I, when I came to Texas, I began uh, seeing just, uh, it wasn't any great revelation, I began seeing gaps in coverage. That whole communities uh, and stories were just simply not being reported. Um, and for whatever reason, whatever motivation, I dwell a little bit in this book, what, what might have been my motivation, some form of uh, uh, what I call white liberal anthropologist guilt. Uh, the upbringing that I had in New York, where my family, uh, my, my dad had grown up in Italy, uh, and when in my household growing up, he would talk about the American people uh, as if we weren't. And uh, our sense of assimilation and, and uh, prejudice that we might have experienced a little bit, not myself as much as my parents, of course. My dad was born in 1909, so you put that in some historic context. Um, and then we did something unique in, in my uh, household in New York, or the various households, we, we white flighted repeatedly. Uh, my family uh, moved uh, four times to move away without, uh, there's no other way of saying it, to move away from the black uh, residents that were moving into our neighborhoods. And, uh, and again, this is a period of time uh, through the 50s and 60s when there was a lot of conflagration and um, urgency, you know, dominating the news, and uh, uh, a lot of anxieties in my household. With that kind of backdrop, I, uh, you know, growing up in New York, I had uh, lived in this rapidly, rapidly changing neighborhood, a very conflicted neighborhood, and, and this white flight neighborhood, and uh, a lot of racial tension. Um, I uh, was probably predisposed at a great degree, I know I was, predisposed at a, at a deep level to sort of roll with the flow and to endorse our movement away from the black residents who were moving into our neighborhoods. I just was. So I was naive uh, and willing to absorb the, uh, the things that uh, I think my family and, and certainly the circles that I grew up in uh, endorsed, as ugly as they were. It just seemed to be the thing to do. I, I didn't have a, what I would call a, a very a conscious mind. Uh, one day uh, when I was a kid, uh, about the age that my son is now, I've got a 12-year-old kid, I uh, rode my bicycle up to the, uh, uh, to the city library, New York City Library in the neighborhood I lived in, and uh, discovered a, a, a thin paperback volume of poems by Langston Hughes. And it's one of the three or four times where I could really say this. Uh, that that uh, some form of, of a light bulb, <laughs> it was a very low wattage, but some form of a light bulb went off over my head. It, it, it was like reading something that had been so deliberately hidden uh, from me. You know that feeling uh, you know, as a kid when your parents are hiding something from you and, and, and the uh, circumstances you're in are, are coalescing to hide things from you, uh, that I, I, I wanted to read more. It was secret, and it was hidden. Um, and and it, it, uh, I, I suppose, ultimately, as I look back, it changed my worldview. It led to uh, things in, uh, that would change my worldview. I, I can't say that I 
you know, woke, we drove back home in my bicycle, or rode home on my bike, and you know, everything was changed at that minute at the age of 12 or 13. But, but it led to a thought process that there was another world, another world that had been deliberately uh, hidden from me, and probably, no doubt, hidden from a lot of folks, and, and uh, intentionally neglected and, and harmed and isolated in many ways. And you know that, you, all of you here know that uh, from, from your, uh, your own smarts and your study of history and, and just your worldview. Uh, but that was sort of my, my little coming of age. So with that kind of backdrop, uh, I, uh, I wound up in, in uh, Texas. Um, I, got, I, went, I moved from the Upper West Side of Manhattan, where I'd been going to college and a couple of three graduate schools till they finally booted me out because I hadn't been paying my bills. Uh, I, um, I, I was on my third school at Columbia University, and I tried to go to a fourth, and they basically said, no, Moss, you, you should really pay for the previous three. So I, I moved to Abilene to take a job at a newspaper, which seemed like a great adventure, and I got off the, uh, the airplane in Abilene and, and tried to hail a cab. I was standing there going like this outside the airport, and uh, so an, an elderly woman came up to me and said, what are you doing? And I, maybe she thought I was saying hi to her, I don't know, but I, I said I'm trying to hail a cab, and she said, you, you, you're really not from here, are you? We, you, know, you, you? In Abilene, there are only two cab companies. One of them just went out of business, actually, so we're down to one, and you have to call it on the phone, so put your hand down. And I, and I, and I did, and that, that was the beginning of my understanding. Uh, I guess it, uh, I was smart enough to know what I didn't know. I didn't know, Jack, shit, excuse my, my language. Um, I, I, I rem I'm remiss in, in mentioning something, too. I, I, just to give you a little tiny bit about my worldview, my mother um, told me a, a few years ago, she's a very wise um, <laughs> a woman who, uh, you know, very Italian and uh, so uh, kind of unfiltered at times, you know, almost operatic, I guess, especially when she was chasing me with a stick. But she um, told me once, so only a few years ago, she said, do you know what the first words were that you had ever heard? Uh, when you were born? Uh, I, I said, no, of course not. How would I know that? And she said, well, the first two words that you ever heard in your life on planet Earth, just your emergence into, into Earth, were, oh, shit. <laughs> I, <laughs> I said, well, okay, you know, like a good storyteller, please tell me more, Mom. And uh, she said, well, you know, she had had four sons, but I was, I was the last. I was number five. And so the assumption was that there would be a girl. Uh, and she basically suggested to me that, that your worldview has been shaped by those first two words that you had ever heard. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm glad members of my family are here because they would back that up. But I, I think it, it, uh, the, the sense is that I, I think I came to Texas uh, with this uh, cautionary uh, you know, message from this person here saying, you don't understand where you are. You don't know this state. You just don't get it in that very overt way. And then coming down here with this, with this other sense that... Um, um, you know, everybody might be approaching me, and as they see me, also forming those same two words I heard when I was born. <laughs> oh shit, here he comes! Um, I, I, uh, those two things together, uh, you know, kind of set the table maybe for my. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to not not fight back uh, so much, but I, I wanted to keep drilling down deeper into Texas um, so that I could begin to learn and that I could learn uh, to not be wary, I suppose, um, of how people would react to me, I guess is the point. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I bounced around in, in just really without a plan, uh, going to a number of different newspapers and then working for some magazines uh, along the way, trying to write uh, books on the side. Um, just. It really wasn't a conscious pattern, but it, but again, it, it seemed a way to get out of the office, get away from editors who wanted to assign me to things that I didn't want to do. And then at a point when I began to familiarize myself just a tiny bit with some of the history uh, that was either overt or uh, I took the time perhaps to absorb by just hanging around with enough people who really knew better than I did, that I, I really very aggressively began uh, trying to almost only work on stories about African-American Texas. It, it's, it's the height of a logic, it's not rational. I don't know that it's good. Um, I don't know that I did a good job. I just know, you know what I did, and I, I tried to leave the office as often as I could 
to go to uh, parts of, of the various cities where I lived where I could just simply talk to people. And I, I suppose I, you know, there's this idea of immersion journalism that people kick around, uh, and it's kind of a conflicted notion. You, know, you just spend as much time as you can immersed in a community. And I think uh, that helped in some ways for me. I was able to trick some editors, uh, cajole them, bribe them, I don't know how, maybe they just didn't want to see me, into spending you know, weeks and sometimes months on stories. I can honestly tell you, I don't know that I emerged with any clarity at the end of those stories. Um, but I did try in some small way, fumbling way, to hold up uh, a, a mirror, a somewhat consistent mirror to what I saw. Uh, and and I, I, some a couple of people who've read some of these stories over the years said, gee, these things are very melancholy, or they're very bittersweet. And, and I actually really like that, because it, it conforms to my notion that, and we're talking about black and white issues, obviously, race, uh, that the real answers that might lie in, in, in some of the relationships uh, that, that I dwell on are actually in the gray zone. There aren't precise answers. And that's no thunderclap. You all know that as well. And we live in such a polarizing age uh, where people need to have that, you know, those certitudes. Um, and really, I think what I tried to do, uh, these might, stories might seem very unsatisfying to you perhaps, because uh, at the end, uh, I break uh, a cardinal rule that, that we you know, sometimes teach over the, in my journalism department, that you know, there should be no questions at the end of your story. You should answer all questions. And I think at the end of my stories, you're probably befuddled and going, well, Jesus, he just raised 40 more questions. But I believe that's a better way to begin the dialogue, because I don't believe in certitudes, and especially as it uh, comes to race. I, I believe in a, a couple of three certitudes that you cannot understand uh, Texas to any degree at all unless you understand the history of race here. This is not going to happen, certainly the country. The state was built in the backs of uh, slaves. Uh, it, it's a, a you know, fiscally driven topic, a culturally driven topic. Uh, every major city, every city in Texas is defined in some way. The way they look are defined by race. The reason highways exist, interstates exist. Um, all of it can be really viewed through the prism of race. I just believe that sincerely. And again, I know a lot of you do too. So uh, um, I, uh, you know, aside from this, this lady kicking my ass at the airport in Abilene, I guess that I, it's so long ago I still remember it. Uh, that I, uh, when I first got to, to, uh, to the Dallas Morning News um, in the, oh, almost 30 years ago, I uh, decided to get out of the office again, get out ahead of the high sheriffs, go wander, take the pulse of the city, um, disappear. And so what I did was go uh, to South Dallas, which is a, a predominantly African-American neighborhood, a culturally rich neighborhood, um, and uh, walk up and down Old Forest Avenue, which some folks... Um, I later learned in the community there, I believe, was actually named after Nathan Bedford Forrest, who had been uh, uh, presumed by some to be one of the founders of the Ku Klux Klan. So imagine that, the main artery running through the primary uh, uh, black neighborhood community in Dallas might have been named uh, you know, for, for decades after the leader of the Ku Klux Klan. By the way, the Ku Klux Klan, many of you know this, had once been headquartered. Uh, in Dallas, a lot of history. It doesn't go away. I think it really seeps into the soil. Uh, and I can get all metaphorical on you. I mean, it literally blood seeping into the soils. So it doesn't go away. Uh, a lot of, lot of young African-American men disappeared in the Trinity River, never to be heard from again. And uh, you hear stories. Um, so I walked up and down uh, the street that was beginning its evolution, I think, uh, obviously, gratefully away from the possibility that it might have been named after the leader of the Ku Klux Klan to being named Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. So what a, what a transformation there. What a story in and of itself. So I'm walking along. I'm a total rube. I've got uh, a big sign on me that says, hit me, I don't know what I'm doing. And um, I'm just bumbling around like I do. And I... Uh, see uh, a dry cleaners that has the most beautiful sign and most attractive sign that I thought I had seen. It said Bacchus. 
and the Bacchus cleaners. And I thought, man, what goes on in the Bacchus cleaners? I got to go there. There must be, a, I hope it's the wine festival day and everyone's in togas. So I'm going to go into the Bacchus cleaners. Just the name itself is summoned me. What a great idea to name your store uh, Bacchus. It's kind of uh, confident. <laughs> so, uh, and then I also thought, I wonder if that would work up in North Dallas. I don't know. But uh, so I go in, and of course, uh, silly me, the man who runs the store is named Jasper Bacchus. That's his name. And he wasn't wearing a toga. Um, he, he wasn't, you know, one of the ancient gods of revelry. But he uh, was a fixture in the community and uh, had been around for a real long time, and he knew things. So I show up, and I've got uh, a little reporter's notebook in my hand and a pen, and I actually had a newly minted business card that, that probably said Senior Rube on it. But I had given it to him, and we begin talking. And he says, well, what, you know, what are you doing? And I'm just... I said, I'm wandering. I'm just trying to take the pulse of the city. I'm kind of new in town. I'm using that line everywhere, even with, with police officers, I guess, when they stop me. But I say that, I, you know, something like that and paraphrasing, but I, I'm just trying to learn, you know, where I've just moved to. So we talk a little bit. Then at some point in the conversation, it had to have been predicated on something I say, but I've exiled it, I think, to my subconscious. Um, he comes out from around behind his counter and uh, begins screaming at me in colorful language, and then uh, throws my business card at me and, and literally chases me out of the, his store. It's a little like the Wild West with the swinging saloon doors. That's the way I remember it. And I'm going backwards, you know, out into the, uh, into the street. It, it, there weren't swinging doors, but it felt like I was in an old John Wayne movie and being tossed to the curb. Uh, and what he's saying is that uh, you're a fake, you're a phony, you're a fraud, you're a, uh, an imposter. Uh, I don't know who you are or what you want. And then he said, and I just, you know, seared into my, my brain, he, he said, no one uh, from any newspaper ever comes here. So you are a liar. You're an ambassador without portfolio. We don't know who you are. I don't know what your, what your game is. And uh, that, that was, you know, right after I had arrived in Dallas uh, almost 30 years ago. And I, I didn't think about it. That's not that long ago, perhaps. But I, I realized, uh, again, I didn't know anything. Uh, there was more to learn. I went back to the paper, and it turned out that he had called the newspaper to ask if I had worked there. Uh, and the presumption, the prevailing wisdom, was that I was a, a, a cop, that I was there writing down things and, and frankly, uh, draw, draw me, drawing up a list, uh, that uh, a punitive list. Uh, no good would come of this. So I really had a lot to learn. I really had to work through some uh, things to understand you know, where I was. Um, and again, I maintain, and I think you will too, if uh, anybody uh, you know, is foolhardy enough to, to, to snag one of these books for your own, you'll, you'll uh, perhaps be um, unsettled by the thought that, that I, I might not have ever learned anything, but that we need to continue the dialogue, we need to continue the discussion, that all of us, in a way, need to stop um, go places that you know we really haven't gone before. I, and forgive me, this is the cue the violin is, moment, but that we need to just um, you know stop, uh, go inside and talk to people and ask them uh, what they're feeling, what they're thinking, uh, and, and, and admit, hopefully, that we don't really know and don't presume to know uh, the context, not just the intimate details. That's actually pretty easy. All of us are so astute and I think wonderful observers. I know many of you are far better observers than me, but that ability to capture in your mind's eye, the camera in, in, in your brain, you know, what's right in front of you. And I, I, you know, I can't remember uh, my own name sometimes. I, I know I'm gonna have trouble finding my car when I leave. I'm gonna have to ask somebody. Um, or get off campus. I took seven left turns. I know that, I know I did. And I found myself back where I was. But, but that whole notion of understanding the, the, the sweep, the panorama, the history, uh, it, it, it's really um, a challenge. But when I think people uh, recognize that you're at least um, coming with your hat in your hand, the, the level of discourse gets a little deeper and it gets a little deeper and, and people do let you in at some point. And the stories you're gonna hear will blow your mind. Uh, they did my mind, and uh, it just becomes a, a, a more fulfilling and rich, enriching process. Um, a lot of dogged work. And I should say, by the way, that, that over time, I 
kind of reconnected a little bit with Mr. Baucus, uh, not to the point where he was giving me a discount on my dry cleaning, but that, um, you know, we, he wasn't chasing me anymore. You know, the irony of that, by the way, is when he was chasing me, I, you know, I, I sort of was jogging a little bit, in, you know, backwards. I might not look like I could jog forwards now, but I was kind of, you know, going in retreat a little bit there. It happened to be um, right by, um, across the street from his place was this really grand old uh, mansion, you know, three-story, uh, beautiful-looking building. Uh, that is where uh, Stanley Marcus had grown up, as in Neiman Marcus. And, and you know, later on when I realized that, it, it just added another layer, another thing to think about, the context. It's one of the most famous you know, entrepreneurs, the mercantile king of Texas. Mr. Henley Marcus's book, I think it was called Who's Minding the Store? Uh, but uh, Neiman Marcus, he's, he's a well-heeled cat. Uh, but here it was his old house that he had uh, probably white flighted out of when he was a kid and his family had left right in the heart of South Dallas, smack dab on, on what is now Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. I was quite comfortable in my knowledge that he, I'm not knocking Stanley Marcus, I'm just saying, I was pretty sure he still wasn't he, you know, living in that house. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you, you begin to think about things, the hidden stories, the things that you don't know that sometimes are right there in front of you. It, it, it got to be an, an inordinate obsession. Uh, I'll try to wrap up here quick in case anybody has any questions, but I, uh, I you know, I suppose on a, on a comical level, uh, you know, my, my wife used to call it my African-American complex and, and say, you know, what, what is it? Why are you, you know, doing this? And uh, I, I don't know. I, uh, I walked in in a meeting one time at the Dallas Morning News and two high-ranking editors were there. This was in the early 80s also. And uh, they were laughing, um, you know, kind of sharing a joke. And I, I, I kind of walked in in their little glass office. We used to call those people glass holes, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for that. For any children here, I just should have given you fair warning there, just a little quick. But uh, so then I walked in, and uh, they're, they're laughing. I, you know, again, I always presume oh, they must be saying the O-S-H-I-T joke about me again. You know, here comes Bill. I don't know. I'm always wary, a little insecure at all times. Uh, and they said, actually, that, you know, there's a joke going on about you. <laughs> okay, great. I'm, I now feel, you know, validated in my insecurity. Uh, what's that? You know, what's the joke? I'll play along. And um, they said, well, the joke is that whenever two black people meet in Dallas, Bill Minataglio shows up. I said, well, uh, you know, I didn't laugh. And I, I still don't really to these days. I think it's more a reflection on them, I hope. I, I feel... Uh, morally superior, you know, just probably framing it this way and telling the story, but it told me something. Uh, it registered on me that something that I had been doing uh, for whatever reasons, and, and probably without uh, a, a calculated process, really, just sort of this organic uh, thing, um, I was developing a reputation, and, and uh, I began receiving awards from uh, uh, black journalist organizations, uh, a lot of them. <laughs> And again, I note, as I said earlier, I'm not black. I, uh, there, was, there was a county commissioner in Dallas, kind of a famous, uh, almost infamous guy, who had gotten, he used to get into a lot of, oh, I don't know, uh, tight situations in Dallas. He'd, 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 he, he would be involved in a lot of protests and, um, you know, kind of, a, he was a community organizer. He was a county commissioner, but he really took it to the powers that be. Um, and oftentimes would come down and frankly uh, protest against the Dallas Morning News. He'd be out front. His name was John Wiley Price. I don't know if anybody knows uh, of him, but um, a, a very famous and some would say infamous or controversial figure. I don't know, but I... Uh, uh, one day he was out protesting in front of the Dallas Morning News and got into this scuffle. A jogger, if I recall, was coming by. Um, somehow, somebody bumped into somebody and this guy injured himself. And you know the, the truth, as I said earlier, is in the gray zone. I don't know exactly what happened, but there was a little bit of a fracas. Uh, and the cops were kind of looking for him uh, after a while, John Wiley Price, the county commissioner. So the, uh, um, the upshot is that he contacted the newspaper. I was at home when all this happened. I didn't really know anything about it, but I was at home um, when I got a phone call from my editor, the big, the big, the, the grande queso, the big cheese, 
uh, called and said, uh, "You, uh, this is strange, but you know, really one of the prominent, I'm paraphrasing, uh, one of the prominent, the perhaps prominent African-American activist in our city uh, w only wants to talk to you and you have to come down here and work on a story and speak with him. And I, I mentioned this in my book that I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do that because of my lack of understanding, uh, my inability to um, articulate uh, the history. I could articulate the overt circumstances. I'm a reporter. I could tell you what happened, maybe. It was a little confusing, but I, a little reporting, I could figure it out, or at least get the official police report and figure it out. But I couldn't um, presume to do what I increasingly wanted to do in a daily newspaper, which was write about 5,000 words about the history that led to this moment, you know, 2.08 p.m. on a hot day in Dallas uh, outside of 508 Young Street, you know, in downtown Dallas. I, it, it, it deserves that. Um, and and I, I think, you know, I, we, we don't do it often enough. There are still a few stalwarts out there in mainstream journalism who actually will, will go long on a story. Not, not for showy adverb adjective reasons, but really I think to try to incorporate that context that panorama, again, that's so necessary uh, and, and important. It could take a lifetime, several lifetimes, and uh, I, I don't know that I ever even, again, uh, remotely got, got close. But these little things, um, anecdotal things, walking in on two editors, and uh, another editor, the, the head of the entire paper, calling me with some befuddlement. I think he was on to me at that point. It's like, holy crap, Minataglia has been sneaking out again. and doing stories. Here's something kind of ironic, by the way, that occurs to me about, uh, that's somewhat symbolic. When I got to Dallas, to work at the Dallas Morning News, um, we had uh, a bureau, you know, newspapers have bureaus, correct? Um, and oftentimes uh, we have them, or in the good flush days, we have them in uh, Mexico City. Um, the Dallas Morning News had, a, when I got there, had a bureau in Toronto, Canada, Toronto. We had one in Mexico City. Uh, we were trying to figure out how to get one in Cuba. We were developing one in uh, Berlin. And guess where else we had one? And this was a title in the in the, 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 the it was called the South Dallas Bureau, as if it was Toronto, as if it was Mexico, as if it was another country. And he, I, that always stuck in my mind. It was I work. <laughs> I could throw a rock from where I sat in my office in downtown Dallas and probably hit, you know, the uh, hit South Dallas. It's not that far away, but it, it was as if it was someplace exotic um, and far away and uh, alien. To use an, an ugly word, um, but that that underscored some things to me too. Uh, and I'm not saying this, uh, trust me, by any stretch to suggest that I was doing anything remotely courageous or really wildly different, but um, oh, I, I guess I was doing something a little different. I, I just wanted to get out of the office again. That, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But um, um, my, my feeling again, a, after time, af after a decade or so, was that um, we were talking about, and, and I was asking Steve's opinion of this all, all the way. It was really my way of interrogating him. What's, what's his angle about wanting to pull some of these stories off the, you know, the dust, out of the dustbin? And, I, and Steve used the word history with me. Uh, and wow, I mean, I, I felt really grateful to hear that, and I still do, that, that, that perhaps, uh, in it, you know, inadvertently, whether it was me, uh, you know, it just happened to be me that I, I had gone out and, and accumulated some stories that in some way uh, constitute some small form of, of the history of Texas. Uh, again, you'll decide if you, if you do read it. If you read it, drink lots of Jolt Cola or Monster Energy Drink, whatever your preferred stimulant is, hopefully, hopefully legal. Um, but that uh, it, it, it just constitutes as a whole these, these little stories, some form of history, a little window in, into things. And uh, uh, you know, an, an era that I, I really do believe is, is somewhat worth remembering. I was able to talk to folks who were in their 80s and 90s back in the 1970s who really had a, 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 you know, a fundamental grasp of, of a different, a really overtly different Texas. I drove around uh, one day with a guy named Donald Payton, who was this really cool, uh, cool cat in uh, 
in Dallas, and uh, self-taught historian. Uh, you know, as I say in the book, he didn't. His goal wasn't to publish in the the great big journal of, of obscure academia. Uh, and, and I'm not knocking that. I guess I'm supposed to be doing some of that now that I'm in academia. Note note to self. Um, but he he was just a guy. He was just a guy who uh, you know sat around in Dallas and, and remembered stories and was afraid that they were going away. So he was a sort of self-appointed, self-anointed, self-taught historian. And his um, um, you know purpose was to chronicle and collect disappearing African American history in Dallas, particularly in Dallas. I was hanging out, so I sought him out. I, I heard that he was an interesting guy. And we were driving around one day, and he took me down to Old City Park. Uh, has anybody ever been there in, in Dallas? It's a collection of uh, beautiful old buildings that have been moved uh, from here and put there all in display. So it's a kind of a time machine uh, experience. There are a bunch of older homes, and they represent different phases of Dallas history. And as we were walking through there, he told me, I want to take you through this uh, park where there are these old buildings. So he's pointing at one building, and he said, that's the home of the people that owned my family, that owned my family. And I, again, realized, my God, I don't know a, a damn thing. We hop in his car, we drive around, we go by um, in the Oak Cliff section of, of Dallas, actually where I was living. He said, take a look at the library, the old library. It was one of the libraries that, that uh, Carnegie had, had funded uh, to be built around the nation. Uh, so it was a beautiful uh, building and um, maybe the product of some enlightened thinking a long time ago. Uh, but he said, look at it. Do you see anything unusual, you know, uh, uh, about this area outside of it? And I, I didn't. And he said, well, look, look more closely over by, um, you know, there, there are two shadows, odd shadows on the wall. And he said, that, that's where the separate, you know, water fountains had been. And his point to me, uh, if, if I could, you know, remember it, and, or, or maybe this is what I drew down from it, is that you... Uh, you know, things in Texas are never what they seem. And the shadows are revealing. And you have to stop, either ask for a, a spirit guide, like this gentleman, to explain them to you, or just sort of work your way through it. And, and, and oftentimes, uh, this, is, this sounds awful, presume, um, presume certainly that there are stories, but sometimes presume that they're unpleasant stories. But don't be afraid to revisit them. They have to be remembered so we could not avoid them, right? In the future, but I, 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 my whole experience was a process again of, of learning to kind of try to see things that, uh, um, trying to see the ghosts and the and the spirits. I I spent a lot of time uh, working on a story uh, down uh, called the, the Trinity Bottom Lands. Um, it's uh, probably the place with with the. Oh, what the most inspiring view of, of the downtown Dallas skyline, yet it, it, it's you know among the most depressed circumstances imaginable. It's an area that used to flood all the time till Dallas had the sense in the 20s and 30s to build some levees. Um, and when I was down there, just just kind of living there, really going there every day and talking to people, um, someone uh, said, "You need to talk to this an elderly woman here who, whose job it was." Uh, back in the days when there had been no uh, levees, or the levees would break, um, or worse, the, the days when the police in Dallas would, would throw a, a, a young black man to his uh, death in the river, um, people would, would summon her to find the body that had been submerged in the water or lost in the water, because the officials weren't going to do it. The officials were the ones that had put the body there. And uh, the story was that she would ask for an article of clothing that had once belonged to the person who had disappeared in the muddy swirl of the Trinity River, and she would throw it out. She would ask to be rowed out into the uh, often swollen river uh, and then uh, take the shirt or article of clothing and, and throw it out on the water, and it would gravitate to the spot where the, that body had been submerged. Okay. Uh, true or not? <laughs> Uh, I, I desperately wanted to believe that story. I hope it to be true. But it, it just suggested to me, again, this other almost spirit world that exists uh, in Texas, uh, everywhere. And uh, my, my tiny little purpose uh, in some of this was just to go out and try to capture, a, you know, two or three of those uh, stories. Again, before uh, 
the folks that were telling them, uh, you know, went away. Um, anyway, I've kind of I meandered, and I got all maudlin there. I didn't mean for that to happen, so please uh, avail yourself of the refreshments on the way out. I brought a big bag. I'm going to take as many things as I can on, on the way out so they don't go to, to, to waste. But if you have any uh, questions uh, or don't throw anything at me, but if you have any questions, I could try to answer a, a thought or two. Thank you for asking your question ahead of time. <laughs> My, my belief is that uh, you know, race defines everything in Texas and that uh, you need to um, um, you know, look at the symptomatic episodes but then look at the evolutionary uh, patterns and trends. You have to work on two fronts. That's really my, my belief um, that, that Texas... Uh, you know, Jim Bowie was a, was a, is, a, I guess, a hero uh, for some in Texas, and his uh, history, I believe, is required learning in schools. And um, forgive me or not, people might start throwing things at me for, for uh, besmirching uh, the, you know, the quality of uh, some education in Texas at, at a lower level. But, but if you scratch the surface and go back, I think you'd find a, you know, things about him. Uh, that, that have been romanticized to a degree that they've taken root and mythology has sort of you know, wrapped itself around the reality and uh, mythology actually prevails. Um, I, I think the cert, you know, the, among the certitudes are the, the fact that, that um, the things we take as, as fact and reality should always be questioned and you should be more of a, a skeptic and, and not trip over into cynicism, get immobilized by that to the degree that you start spouting off generalities or polarizing statements again. Um, that's really what I was getting at, and, and I, I'm probably not very clear on it, so forgive me. It's, now, you're, now you're almost like in one of my classes. <laughs> so you don't have to take it. Let's look at the upside. The, uh, that that you, you, you really persist first at looking, um, studying the symptomatic, intimate details of history in Texas. Uh, and consider them uh, in a way as certitudes, they happened, but then work on this other uh, track that you look at again, as I call it, the macrocosmic viewpoint, that, that uh, something caused, led, um, maybe inspired those circumstances. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Um, Naples, yeah, they're from Naples. Uh, have you ever been to Naples? No. It's the craziest city in the world. When I went there with my wife for the first time, we uh, got out of the train station and began walking down the street, and a guy uh, came up on the sidewalk in a motor scooter, and uh, I, you know, my wife and I are walking pretty close, I would assume, and he just begins talking to her, saying, leave him. <laughs> Come with me. You're too good for him. And then I, I said, wow. I, <laughs> probably one of my relatives. You know, I, I, uh, just a nutty uh, but, a, but beautiful place. My, my dad was filled with a, a lot of, uh, you know, oh, I don't know, superstitions, you might call them. I, I think he thought a lot about spirits. My dad's job, uh, would, he was a printer for all of his life, so I have a little ink in my veins, and I, I always probably rom romanticized that story. That's why I got into it. But he, one of his gigs, one of his jobs as a kid, we had this gigantic printing press in our basement called a Heidelberg uh, Press. It was a big thing. It was actually a beautiful thing. It had big wheels on it, a beautiful piece of machinery. Um, and he, he's old school. He was born in 1909, so he worked with pieces of, of lead and type and hot... Uh, type, 
Um, but one of his main jobs was to print prayer cards. I used to call them Italian baseball cards, these little, you know, holy cards. And so uh, in, in his way, uh, it's my story and I'm sticking to it, he was sort of a, a, a little bit of a, a journalist in a way because he had to know when everybody died and when they got married and, uh, you know, baptized because he would have that information to put on his cards. So, uh, but he... Uh, you know, I grew up, uh, I was a Catholic altar boy. Uh, don't uh, judge me on the basis of any recent news events or anything in that regard. I, I don't know the Pope personally, I, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I grew up in a world, I, I you, you know, had, had, to, had to recite Latin mass, you know, and I didn't know what I was saying and, and probably inhaled too much incense, as you could probably tell, but I, uh, but I grew up in a, in a world filled with, uh, you can call them superstitions, you can call it faith. And, and so I think I was predisposed to look for a lot of that bittersweet thing, the things that, that you have to have. Um, I, I remember interviewing somebody in the, in the Rio Grande Valley in, in Edinburgh. It was a story about uh, uh, curanderos and folk healers. And a, a, a woman very succinctly said to me, we, we have nothing but faith. We have nothing monetary. We only have faith. And I, I, we, you know, I, I grew up just a, a, a tiny bit in that world, so immersed in a world where you think a lot about faith. Everything is presumed to be faith-based. You have some adherence to some, um, you know, speculation of the future. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, I think I brought some of that to a little bit that I, I worked on. And that sounds kind of pretentious, but. Uh, it's a long answer to this. I do this in class all the time. People ask me what time it is, and then suddenly it's time to leave the room. I gave you a very long answer, Stephen Hawking's history of time, and someone just asked me, what, you know, was it 3.30 or, or 3.45? So he's from Naples. It's a, it's a very, very wacky, wacky city, and I love that place, except for the fact that a guy tried to steal my wife uh, right literally from in front of me. What was the other question? I'll be brief. What about, um, you talked a about the I, yeah, I, I didn't, uh, you know, I, I can't speak to that. I'm not an expert. And, uh, um, you know, that's another book. Yeah, I would sort of answer it that way. There's so many things. Uh, Buffalo Soldiers, alliances uh, with the South during the war in Texas. Just hidden history everywhere. It's just extraordinary. Um, the educational system in Texas. Uh, it, it's amazing. So, Ellen? Um, <laughs> I, I know my, you know, mom, you know, bless her soul, she, she actually passed away not too long ago, and I, I, uh, you know, I don't think she was all that comfortable. There's a, a small anecdote in, in here, you know, about a, a moment as a young man when uh, we had white flighted yet again, and, and I had made uh, best friends with a African-American uh, guy who was in my school. He was the only African-American guy in our school. So it was because we needed to move to an area where there weren't many African Americans, and uh, I, I was the new kid in school. So you know, you, I guess outsiders maybe gravitate to each other. I don't know, but um, there's nothing more than that, really. Uh, he came to my house one day when I was a kid, and I, I you know, I, I wrote about it here. It's things you don't forget. My mom turned him away from the door, said I wasn't there. And in fact, I, I was there, and I could see him being there, and I didn't do anything about it because I didn't. Um, uh, my, my family had a, had a pretty deep uh, and, and very unsettling to me, you know, streak of racism in it. I, I have no other way to say it. It's just, it's just true. Um, it, which seemed completely at odds to their whole theory that they had suffered some form of, you know, bias and prejudice, you know, coming up. I could never. Uh, well, we had some bad arguments, <laughs> really, some very intense. I said some really, uh, very regrettable and ugly things, but uh, you know, very passionate and unfiltered as it. You know, as a teenager could be, um, and, and then later in life, yeah, I, I think they were not wildly happy uh, about some things that I wrote. Yeah, 
a good question. <laughs> Anybody, Steve? Um, no, you know, I, I was thinking about it the other day. Uh, Van Morrison is coming to play at uh, at UT. Uh, you know, for for you, you, the older folks here, you know, Van Morrison, big uh, '60s and '70s guy. I mean, he's still very popular today, but he, you know, he kind of first became popular. And I, I remember listening to him a lot. You know, I was back in my pseudo hippie days, and um, he. Uh, I was just thinking of this the other day because I found my old cassette. Ta I still have a car that plays cassette tapes. I'm very proud of that. That fact, and my cassette tape from 1974 or six still worked, and I put it in there. It's like, wow, maybe I've got some eight tracks back here. I could try that too. But um, it was a Van Morrison's uh, covering a Bobby Bland song, uh, which, which is really the perfect, poignant, bittersweet song. I've already ordered it to be played at, at you know, Maudlin. Jeez, when I when I croak, it's got to be played. So anybody shows up, you know, please try to remember that. Um, but I. Uh, it's called, uh, you know, ain't, ain't Nothing You Can Do, and it's, it's a very bittersweet kind of song, but, but sort of rollicking in its way. Uh, it has sort of that New Orleans upbeat uh, lift to it, kind of a jump blues, but when you really listen to it, it's the lyrics. Uh, it's perfect blues in that sense, you know, uplifting, uh, an uplifting, bittersweet song. How, how can that be? But I, I, I work backwards, just like everybody else. You know, you have your records, and you realize, wait a second. As earnest and, and as good as this is by this uh, performer, I wonder who sang it first. And, and no, well, I, I moved to Texas, and uh, especially in San Antonio, um, you know, Jan, Jan Reed, a great Texas writer, uh, some of you know him and know his work, uh, just wrote a book about Doug Somm, a great uh, uh, musician uh, from San Antonio who grew up across the street as, as a kid back in the 40s and 50s from something called the Eastwood Country Club which was the outpost, um, I'd say, in, in the greater South Central Texas region. I would include you know, Austin in this whole mix. It was the outpost for traveling blues musicians of some stripe. You know, B.B. King and Bobby Bland and uh, Albert King, all the greats, the gods, would, would come to that place, Etta James, to the Eastwood Country Club, and it happened to be across the field, I think about 300 yards away from this, where this white guy, Doug Somm, grew up. Uh, and it, it really was like, uh, you know, as I, I call it, summoning smoke. Uh, he heard the music and it drew him over and he realized, again, there's another world that people hadn't been telling him about. And I got to San Antonio when that place was still around. Uh, and a lot of the great, really old uh, places, these sort of barns almost in the outskirts of town were still around. And, you know, the, you know, the posters, they get nailed up to telephone poles. You see them for, for sale in Antone's record store up in... Uh, uh, up in Austin, but uh, um, I went to a lot of those shows <laughs> back in the 70s and 80s, particularly in Houston, which is an unbelievably rich and complex uh, legacy of, of you know race relations and, and then music, uh, almost secondarily, but but interwoven. So uh, no, I didn't know anything until I got to. Uh, you know, again, I still don't know, but I didn't know. Uh, Texas is so profoundly important when it comes to to music. You know that, and blues music in particular, oh my lord, so sophisticated in, in a way. I, I think structurally, I've heard musicians talk about it, um, a, a marriage at, at some refined level over time, ultimately, of urban sensibilities and rural urgencies and this rural uh, poignancy uh, merging. And again, merging often in places like Houston and, and Dallas. Dallas gets... Uh, short shrift, you know, we're, we're pretty self-congratulatory as, as well we should be living in a great uh, part of the state, you know, here in San Marcos and, and Austin, this area, and, and um, so a lot of us, you know, a lot of folks in a knee-jerk way diss uh, Dallas and, and even Houston, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, it, 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 obviously you know there's a great, rich, hidden, again, some, some ways, uh, musical histories in those places. Uh, back in the 90s, a, a guy I know up in Dallas called me, uh, a great amateur musicologist, Chuck Nevin, I wrote about this in the book, who said, you're not going to believe this. There's a man living in a place called Elmo, E-L-M-M-O, Texas, who has been basically, uh, apparently he was abducted you know, 50 years ago by uh, um, an unidentified flying object and then held up there for a little bit and then brought back to Earth because he's playing music that's in a time capsule. It's It's just pristine music that has not been heard or played you know, since the late 40s and, and early 50s. I said, okay, sure. 
did you bunk your head today? And, you know, what else happened? And uh, he's an old hippie. I thought maybe he was having some bad flashback. So uh, I went with him to see this, this gentleman, Henry Qualls in Elmo, Texas. There's a photograph of him in the book. And I, I, everything suddenly dissolved. In, in the, I felt like I was watching black and white television. In fact, I was on an episode of a black and white television program. It was just, I, you know, it was like ro walking through Havana and seeing every car being from the 1950s. Everything was set in the Wayback Machine. The man was living uh, such an elemental life, uh, hunting for his own food, using uh, folk remedies to heal himself and to... Uh, lubricate his thinking. He was making a very powerful kind of wine that after a few attempts at that, I wanted no more because I needed to drive home. Uh, and then uh, just playing a form of music that, again, uh, dated back to the 40s, 50s, Mance Lipscomb and Frankie Lee Sims, these iconic artists. He had grown up in this isolated way. So I wrote a story, and, it, and you know, like you do in disposable mainstream journalism, sometimes you put superlatives on things because you think it's going to sell. And so the editors said, you know, this is the last true Texas blues man who's, quote, been discovered, which is, again, another weird misnomer. That, that gives that whole sense, again, of, of, you know, the great white liberal anthropologist, you know, parachuting in somewhere and discovering this heretofore, you know, hidden civilization. It's so derogatory and demeaning to frame it that way. But, 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 but we did, so there. Uh, the editors did. I, uh, I, I, but, but, but I guess they really gave us such a long answer, I gotta stop it. But the, the idea is that there are still these things here. I'm convinced that if you go uh, around Texas to, in th th this is where journalism has not served you know, our state well. Some people have, some people have tried to do this in some way, and again, I'm not saying I did, but, but there are so many stories that were just not told. So many stories just not told. I, I was, uh, I had to write a story in, uh, for the 50th uh, anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack. So, what did I do? I raised my hand and said, because everybody was going to write a big package for the Dallas Morning News, and I raised my hand and said, I'd like to write about what was going on in, in African American Texas at that time. And uh, basically, they said, okay, well, good luck with that. And I, I knew what they meant. We, there were no stories to be found in the Dallas Morning News, uh, any of the mainstream newspapers, because we didn't even have then a South Dallas Bureau. It just wasn't covered. It was ignored, a whole other world. And uh, so gratefully, some, you know, obviously creating, uh, crusading journalists in Texas have uh, had, had, you know, these wonderful uh, African-American newspapers. I went back and found uh, the week of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the lead story in the Dallas Express, the, the very important, um, unbelievable to read, scary to read newspaper that, again, you know, covered the black uh, Dallas. The lead story that week uh, in it uh, was about the fact that a, a man from Dallas, a, uh, a janitor, he was a high school janitor, had gone to visit some relatives in Pittsburgh, Texas. Um, you know, kind of in the kind of the northeast part of the state. Uh, and while there, this is almost uh, sadly uh, uh, redundant, he was accused of um, being too forward with a white woman in town, uh, was taken off to uh, a prison, uh, to, to the jail, rather, in Pittsburgh, Texas, uh, where uh, later uh, that day, uh, 200 people from town broke in according to the story in the Dallas Express, broke in, took him away, took him to a, a doctor's office in town and castrated him. It's the lead, lead story in the Dallas Express in the week of the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was written in first person. It's written by the, the guy who had, had, uh, had uh, experienced this. Uh, it was accompanied by some drawings that were really fascinating. I, I guess they had a uh, someone on staff to do drawings and uh, uh, you know, so I don't know. I'm totally meandering again. And these stories, you know, that are, that are hidden. Uh, I used to read the Dallas Express all the time to understand the musical history of Texas because it had wonderful articles about these glorious artists who had come to town and had to stay, as you know, as you would guess, in uh, segregated environments and coming in the back doors of restaurants and all that. And, and a lot of this would be articulated there, but. You don't have to go very far again uh, to see either see those shadows on the the missing water fountains or, or these stories. I I uh, 
actually inter wound up interviewing some members of that man's family. I kind of dropped the Pearl Harbor story and, <laughs> and uh, sought out some uh, of his relatives who you pretty much, you know, affirmed uh, the story as, as he had told it. So, anything else? I, I meander all over the map. You need a map to follow me, don't you? We should have, you should have been issued a map or a GPS. Everybody gets a complimentary GPS. And an iPad. I think Steve was going to arrange that. I forgot to mention that. So make sure to pick up your, your the uh, the 3G iPad. I think it's the not the lesser one. But if you have any other, is that how? Oh, okay. <laughs> Delegation. Uh, if if there's any other questions, uh, if not, th thank you very very much for enduring me. I really really appreciate it.